Hey, everybody. Hey. Welcome to the show. We're live coast to coast around the world. It is the Untitled Themed Entertainment Lockdown Show, episode number 13. I really love the number 13. That is like my favorite number, uh, just just so everyone knows that. Uh, we have a special guest, but Andy, before we bring on RJ, how you doing? I'm doing good. Um had a weird fourth, I think, like everybody else. It was a complete and utter war zone here in Burbank uh, <laughs> for a good three or four hours. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, it was something. Uh, you know, America. I think that, like, people, uh, they just, they weren't going, they weren't going out to the different shows they have that are a little more organized. And so people just uh, shut off. In my little neighborhood here, I, within a 360, there were about four different people showing off some pretty high-level fireworks. So um there you go happy fourth of july all that kind of good stuff um you're listening to fourth of july talk here on untitled theme park entertainment design show without further ado why don't we go ahead and bring on rj onto the show everyone give him a big hello what's up guys how you doing (laughs) good to see you man uh so folks if you're out there well let's hear you comment on it i'm actually curious if the comments are working there was a little bit of a weird metrics issue it wasn't showing that anybody was watching even though i could tell on youtube there was so I want to make sure the comment feature is working. So if you don't mind folks just going and chiming in, saying hello, that would be fantastic or else the whole system might not be working. We'll see. Um, RJ, welcome. Uh, we're happy to have you. You know, me and you go way back to the Mako uh, event at uh, SeaWorld at <laughs> Apple First Flies. <laughs> and uh, we went, uh, it's been great collaborating with you ever since. Um, so welcome to the show. We're going to go ahead and get into our topic a little bit later. But first off, we want to go ahead and talk all about uh, the news. Uh, how about that? Does the news sound good? Okay, good. Doug, right. is, thanks, Doug. Looks like the comments working great. Uh, let's get into the news. Oh, 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 oh yeah, it's all coming in. It's all coming in. Boom, oh. boom. All right, yeah. Something was weird with the. Uh, I swear, something was weird. Things weren't coming in earlier, but now they are. All right, we got a lot of news. Um, let's go ahead and start off with some of the most uh, interesting news um, for the industry. I'll say, uh, at least operationally speaking, is. Uh, while Disney World reopens in the coming weeks, uh, coming week, I guess. So they have uh, cast member previews, annual pass holder previews, and then they will be officially doing a, it's like a phased opening, but only by a few days. So um, that's happening. Um, what do you guys think? Pass. <laughs> pass. Yeah. Pass. Is there such thing as a double pass? <laughs> a double pass I don't work for, I don't work for or rely on Disney for anything right now. So I'll just go ahead and chime in that. Uh, you know, honestly, I, I think Disney owes the public an explanation for how we have, you know, 10,000 cases a day, um, anywhere from 700 to 100 cases in Orange County, Florida a, a day. I, I think we're due an explanation, to be honest. If they have some data that, you know, Disney's a world-renowned company, they obviously may know something that we don't, but it'd be great to hear something about what they've done because, uh, it's it's you know and Universal is obviously they're open too so you know I get it I I think that we're in a place now where uh, most people coming to Universal are not from they're from Florida so what happens when you start opening up the, the state for more and more people and they go start going back to their homes like I don't I just I look I want this industry to rebound more than anybody um, I want it, the parks to reopen um, but when you compare us with the rest of the world. We're just really not there. We're just kind of reopening. So I'm I'm very intrigued to see how that's going to play out. Um, you know, I, I was I, I we have a little bit of a rule in our house that like when cases are lo- lower than a hundred a day in or in Orlando, we'll go to the parks and not worry about it too much. Which is when oh. they were like forty and fifty, we were I was going to Disney Springs and uh, I went there a couple times and went there because it's like okay, fifty out of a million people. Now we're at like eight hundred and nine hundred people a day. Uh, it's a bit dicey. I'm not sure to see if anybody is saying anything yeah. um, about that. No. Um, yeah, we, have, we'll we, have, we have two or 3,000 a day here in Los Angeles, new cases. Yeah. And, um, but, I mean, I, I don't know. I thought, about, I thought about this a little bit. And, you know, originally, how, you know, remember how we talked? I mean, I predicted that Universal would open well before Disney. Mm-hmm. And, I, and because that's because, you know, Disney is a much bigger, much more conservative company, I think, fiscally, socially, uh, thematically. Um, and, I, you know, they, they voluntarily closed, if I recall, didn't they? Yeah, they did. They, yeah. Universal beat them to the punch a little bit. They announced it was a little it was hard because 
Disneyland announced and then Walt well, Disney World announced. Like it was a little bit of a scattered of how it all went down. And now I feel like, you know, now they're just sort of like I think they're they're pivoting a little bit to like, oh, but like the state says we can open and the stockholders and the value of the company. And I think they're starting to turn a little bit more inwardly thinking instead of outwardly thinking in terms of, you know, responsibility. I think they're, th they're thinking more fiscal responsibility and PR responsibility to like their employees. Like if they didn't bring all their employees back as soon as they could, that would be a bad look. So like, which is a worse look opening and risking the lives of the employees and the public or leaving everyone out of work and like, you know, losing billions of dollars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that this is just, you know, this is new territory just all together. Like oh, this, sure. this is just, you know, us trying to figure out how to walk again, you know? Yeah. And so um, I think that everybody overall is doing the best they can in a situation that's really rough um, because you got to keep in mind, you know, Orlando is like the, the mecca of the entertainment world. So for us to literally, you know, be on our backs is, is kind of like not how we used, used to do things, you know, we never have done it that way. And so to kind of show some kind of strength that we are around, they're doing some kind of efforts. Uh, of course, with families and friends and people, you know, with COVID, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of layers to this. And so trying to do something is kind of what these companies are, are trying to accomplish. And so it's just going to be clanky for a while. It's going to be weird for a while, but hopefully uh, somebody will make some good decisions. And I mean, it's, it's just one of those things. You just play it. You just fake it until you make it, you know? Well, speaking of, so, so, okay. So Walt Disney World's reopening looks like they're doing it. Uh, if you would have asked me two weeks ago, I would have bet a thousand dollars on that. But I also, apparently I'm not a good gambler. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my, my over, my over under for Disneyland opening was August 1st. And when they announced July 17th, I'm like, damn it. And yeah. then they announced they weren't opening. I'm like, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We'll see what happens. Obviously, I'm very happy that there's light. Like, okay, yeah. people are going back to work because the government just is terrible and they weren't able to figure that whole thing out. So I'm happy about that. Um, but it's very mixed. Like, I spend most. I'm, I spend myself on all these side projects right now, like trying to give back to the community, doing the, the shows like this because, like, I kind of need so many things in my brain going on so that it's I can sleep at night and not sleep and terror, which is what I normally do. Um, <laughs> that sounds it, terrible. So we have a couple of positive news stories that, I, that we should shout and, and talk about. Um, so the Born Stuntacular officially opened at Universal. So um, congratulations to all the people, the operations team members. Um, kind of crazy opening a show during, um, you know, this time. I was actually pretty surprised to see that they did it and didn't table it maybe for the Christmas season, uh, you know, get a reason to publish, you know, to bring people bodies in. It's kind of interesting, but um, they push through and open it up. That's great. What do you guys think about Born Spectacular reopening? We are avoiding spoilers on this show. I don't like to see shows on video. I like to see them in person. But any thoughts about the general nature of a reopening? Yeah, uh, I think. Yeah, I think this is great, especially for Universal. Um, for them to lose Sinbad, you know, in Isles of Adventure, you know, which is more a stunt devil um, show. You know, um, I think that having something that is around that wheelhouse, you know, I think is, is really a great um, thing to, to add on. So I, I totally think it's, it's a, it's a great thing. It's a great uh, storyline. I mean, Terminator had the same concept, but it looked like this new experience is going to be like so cutting edge with all the latest technology, you know, um, blending with actual live action. So I, I can't wait to check it out. Yeah. The pictures I've seen look spectacular. Uh, I'm super pumped to see it. I mean, I was, Planning to go in August. Not sure if I'm going to go in August, but as uh, soon as I go, that'll be my, one of my first stops. Yeah. Cool. Good stuff. Um, and then we had some other news. I think positive news. Um, we Splash Mountain is getting a, re, a new theme, rethemed uh, to uh, the uh, Princess and the Frog. And so we didn't. We haven't talked about this quite yet. We we weren't ready to really talk about it, and we knew RJ was coming on, and so. RJ, do you want to kind of just start the discussion about your thoughts about Splash Mountain? Um, it'd, be, it'd be great for you to just any insights you have about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that this is truly a, a great uh, time to rebrand it. Um, this, the story, of course, was based around Song of the South, uh, which was always had a lot of controversy in itself. And so to, to kind of renew it, uh, renew the ideas and, and make it more about a story that is 
basically around the first Af African American princess, um, is is truly a groundbreaking moment. This is a this is a great time for Imagineers and a great time for the creative of, of Disney um, for them to be able to take something on um, that truly has always been you know an issue and yeah. then make it into something great. And so I wish them the best. Um, there's going to be a lot of um, a lot of things to kind of consider um, as as in development, but I'm sure with the team they're going to do an awesome job um, making something unique and fun for everybody to check out. Looking forward to it. It's going to be it's going to have a lot of great music. I mean, the characters have always been great. You know, um, I, in many cases, I, I I wish that this happened sooner. You know, yeah. um, I mean, it, it could have easily have been a live show. It could have easily been a, an attraction a long time ago. And I mean, the characters are strong. The music is strong. I mean, I can't wait to see Dr. Facilier in there. He's just going to be incredible. Mm -hmm. um, um, so looking forward, it's just a lot to to check out. Mama yeah. Odie, it's great. <laughs> I'm friends with, with Michael Leon Woolley, who's uh, he's the the alligator in the show, in the movie. Uh, and, yeah. And, uh, Boy, is he excited? He's just like, you know, over the moon, just like, you know, I'm going to Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, oh no, I, no, I was just saying that this is this is a great opportunity, even for the African American community, to have something, you know, as that is legendary as being in an attraction and 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 letting that stay for centuries. I mean, that's this is going to be awesome for everyone. Yeah, I, you know, and, and you know, when I first heard the rumor, or not the rumors, it was really just that online petition and hearing the calls for it. You know, I, I had a lot of conversations with a lot of different people about it. You know, I was trying to figure out like what, how do people feel? How you know, I, how connected to the source material is it versus not? And you know, I, you know, it was obviously they had a, you know a couple different ideas that were kind of rumbling around. And Imagineering always has ideas that are floating around, but I think it was a very bold thing to do. Um, and I, I applaud them. And honestly, I think there's going to be a lot of changes that need to happen in the parks to get things up to up to speed with the 20, you know, with the, the new 2020 lens that we all have. Um, I, it's so cliche, but these these parks aren't museums. You know, they're they're places that are there for education and um, they're very powerful modes of storytelling to affect the culture. And um, Disney's at the forefront of it. You know, we did, we saw the Kaepernick announcement today, uh, partnering with them for digital media and, so with ESPN, so I'm, I applaud them. Uh, I'm and I, you know the first thing I did when we heard the news was we went and watched it on Disney Disney Plus. Um, it is so much more applicable as a log ride than um, Song of the South is. To be honest with you, I was watching this. It, it paints itself like you can envision this ride being a uh, being easily uh, rethemed. Um, so I'm I'm excited about it, and I do have somebody I want to bring on the show to talk about attraction rethemes. At some point, we'll see when I can get him on. I'll have to twist his arm to get him on here. But um, it, it, it's a, it, I'm, I'm happy about it. I'm excited. And, you know, also, I'm also just excited to hear a, a, a project getting greenlit right now. That's that's great. We need yeah. projects that are happening in the industry. So um, we all know what that means. Um, I'm looking forward. I wish them the best of luck. I think it's going to be a, I, it, it just, if you watch the movie, you can tell that it's it's so much more applicable to the IP and, and I'm, I'm excited uh, to the ride system. So I'm really excited about that. Oh yeah, cool. <laughs> Anybody else want to chime in? So we have a couple, of, a couple of cool thoughts. I'll just, I'll just uh, bring in here. All right, yes, I'm so ready to go down the bayou with these characters. I would love to be a fly on them while Imagineering right now. Absolutely. Uh, yes, can't wait. From Kevin, oh, uh, yeah. hey, Andy. <laughs> hey Kelly. Uh, <laughs> and then there's a couple other just, a uh, couple other just uh, comments that are coming through. We have a lot of people watching, actually. I think we're growing our following, Andy. I don't know what happened, but... Um, well, we produce good content, you know, and it spreads. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. And then, uh, so that about wraps it up for the news, folks. Um, thanks for sticking with us. Now we're going to talk about stay, how to stay creative during a pandemic. So um, for those of you that watch our show, we like to, we get a guest, we wrangle them, we twist our arm and say, hey, what do you want to talk about? So that me and Andy can do as little as work as possible uh, throughout the week. Um, but we, we book great guests, so we're, it was worked out every single time. Um, so, uh, what do you, what do you have to say, RJ? Yeah, yeah. Of course, you know the theme the entertainment industry is at a major halt. Uh, a lot of us have have tried to figure out, you know, what what does this all mean, you know, for creatives? You know, how do we continue to keep our gears turning? Um, not having projects, not being 
funded. You know, a lot of a lot of people have been furloughed, um, staying at home, waiting to come back to work, and others have completely have lost their jobs. Um, this is truly an interesting time. And so, as a creative, you know, you're trying to figure out like, you know, how do I even stay motivated uh, during a time where it seems like everything that I wanted to do and and all the things that I was doing all the time just all of a sudden just stopped. Um, one thing about creativity, you know, creativity has never left. It really is all about how you utilize your time. And um, and so I thought about a few, a couple of things um, as I was, you know, being at home quarantined like everyone else. Um, uh, the, one thing I've learned about about creativity is that, especially when you when you're, when we're in a situation like this where you have to stay still um, and you have to focus on yourself, you have to. It, it really shows you. Uh, it tests your create your creative capacity. You know what have you been able to do? You know where it doesn't require you to do something at the job. You know one of my favorite things I love to say is that my favorite my favorite shows I ever created was what I do for my family. You know, being, being <laughs> you know you have to be creative all the time. It's not always tied to a project or tied to you know a show or you know something like that. I think sometimes we forget that creativity surpasses million dollar budgets. It's all about what you don't have and, and what do you do when you don't have anything. And, <laughs> and that's what makes creativity creativity. And so when everything is taken away, that really shows you like where your creative level is. And so if anything, it's like a, it's like a reality check, like, whoa, I thought I was really creative, but mm. you know, I don't have anything in front of me. Like I really don't have any, I'm really not being motivated, you know? And so I think that's the thing that really cripples a lot of people. Um, and so, so again, it, it, it showed me my true state of, of my creative capacity. Another thing it showed me um, my discipline. Like, man, like, you know, one thing about, you know, being paid is like, oh, I, I work, especially a lot of people are working from home now. Yeah. And so <laughs> and so when you actually go in an office and you and you have a desk and you have a place where you can work on something, of course, it's easy to be disciplined. You know, when someone is coming to your desk and saying, how does that how does how, how is that coming along? All right. Great. All right. We got this meeting at two. All right. Great. You know, we got this deadline. And then when, but when you don't have all that going on, it's like, man, like it's really the Lone Ranger. Like <laughs> and, and, and it's funny as I feel bad for a lot of people that actually had to still work from home because it's their first time, like utilizing the technology, you know, really, you know, it's so funny. Like some people will use like 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 teams or something like that or a pro or a software like that, but they don't really use it at the job like that. But working at home, like you had to really know the software, like how everything functions. I mean, no one really heard of a Zoom until all this happened too. So, <laughs> but Zoom been around forever, you know. So, um, just being disciplined with the software and being disciplined with yourself is another thing. And then um, another thing is how you handle pressure, you know. Um, knowing like, like, dang, like this, like my life is changing, you know, personally and, and career wise. You know, what, what, what steps do I take? And so, um, those were some three things that I thought about. Um, being home uh, that just really just captivate, captivated me about the importance of always staying, staying strong in your creativity, you know, not allowing, you know, the, the noise around you to be the problem that causes you to not grow. You know what I'm saying? And, and um, so some things I thought about that you can do to keep your creativity going is um, to literally be inspired by everything, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, that's such a cliche thing to do, but, you know, um, I love having little trinkets and things around the house. You know, one thing I love about my daughter is that she's very, very creative. She always has like names to all of her animals and toys and, you know, stuff like that. And so it really, it forces me to, to, to be inspired, you know, all the time, you know, like, like, I mean, literally, like these characters that she come up with, I need they need social security numbers at this point. I mean, I'm just like, <laughs> like really like <laughs> but but then they have personalities and they have all these different things. And so it's kind of like, you know, that's just that simple thing of being a dad inspires me to, to be creative and join in on that story. And then it also gives me the ability to apply that. So when I do. My, my big shows and, and stuff for major companies like I always do, you know, working in, in themed entertainment, I can apply those same principles. Um, 
Um, and then another thing too, I got two more and then I'll, I'll hush up, but two, two other things is, um, is creating your own stories. I think sometimes, you know, people forget that, okay, you can create stuff for people all day long. That's cool. But what about your own stories? And so like for me, you know, I created uh, my own company, the Abit Imagination Workshop. I've had it for since 2006. Um, we used a tour. We had 12 different stage plays, uh, 50 original characters, um, and, and, and dozens of soundtracks. And I've maintained that throughout the years. Even when I've done stuff for major companies, I've always have nurtured, you know, my ideas. And so, because uh, I, I always was a fan of creating my own stories and, and creating that. And, and, and then not only that, like learning things from the major companies that I've worked for and applying that to, you know, things. So just in case a pandemic happens, just in case something happens, you know, I have something that I can rely on to keep me motivated and to also monetize on. Um, and then being able to package it, you know, and then seeing like what you can do with it. And so just just being curious about your creativity, not letting the pandemic and everything get in your way and, and just have fun knowing that creativity never went anywhere. You know, it's all about what you do with it. Yeah. I Yeah. I some things that I've been doing. Well, I I uh, there was a period where I was between projects for a long time and uh, it was very hard to stay motivated. And I, I, there was no reason why I was, I was not working. It was just, I couldn't find a really land a gig at the time. And, um, I, that's when I wrote, I co-wrote a book and having a partner to be creative with was so important. So, um, for anybody out there that's watching and is, is trying to be creative alone to me, that is so difficult. So if you're able to sit by yourself and be creative, that's fantastic. I am I definitely the type of creative person that likes to react and have input and 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 like here are the parameters and I go and I can I can make it work. Um, and and so uh, having people that you're working with is so important. Like right now, I'm involved with several different like student projects and helping mentor people. And um, and so I, I would just say that uh, having people that you're working with is huge. You know, getting. Getting a graphic designer, if you're a writer, get an illustrator and start collaborating together. Like, hey, I'm going to write a story that you can storyboard and vice versa. Hey, I'm going to write a storyboard. Great. Or I'm going to draw a storyboard. Can you write the story for this? Like, there's so much collaboration that I think can go on. Um, Andy, before we get to you um, to chime in, why don't we go ahead and pull up some of the comments? You know, this is an interactive thing. Uh, let's see what we got. This is interesting. So in the lockdown, I've had the opposite creative problem. I have been more productive than ever, but no one seems to be watching. Engagement across various platforms has gone to zero. So I would be I would be very interested. What platform? Hold on. What platforms are you are you on? Um, I mean, LinkedIn is off the charts for me right now. Like I'm getting thousands of people um, viewing my posts, and I will share other people's material. So I'm kind of curious what platforms you're talking about, what specifically? Because I think now more than ever, people are using LinkedIn because they're out of they're out of work, unfortunately. Um, and LinkedIn's always a desolate wasteland for, for content anyways. So, um, I'm interested if you want to elaborate a little more, we're happy to, to see more. Um, what do you guys think about that? Andy, are you on share? Uh, well, I, mean, I, I, I barely have a presence on LinkedIn. I mean, I don't maintain my LinkedIn really that much. Uh, but, um, it's funny, you know, you've actually, uh, you're, you've been an influence on me to like, maybe take a little bit more seriously and, and, you know, I, I'll tell you what, you know, I went from logging on twice a year to twice a month. That's good. <laughs> That's probably <laughs> <it. laughs> yeah, Just to like, like the post that I tag you in, like, oh, I got tagged in a post. I'll go. I mean, like, like, but occasionally I'll get an email. It's just like, for, I'll, I'll, I'll get an email of all the people that want to connect with me. And it's like, uh, then there's like a list of 30 people I have to click accept, 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 accept. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's good. It's, uh, it's, it's an interesting, per you know, your, your position as a, you know, a, a, a music producer is, is different than, what kind of what I use it for versus, right. you know, but um, no, it's, it's interesting. It's for sure. Interesting. Let's see what we got here. Uh, my motivation is the high on life and who's the leaders in the industry and what is the dissection of an immersive world? Hmm. Cool. Any uh, thought on, on that, Andy? Who's the leaders in the industry and what is the dissection of an immersive theme world? Yeah. I'm into that too. I mean, uh, Skywalker Brian, I recommend uh, uh, there's the books by Scott Lucas if you want to really get into an academic uh, dissection of themed worlds. Mm -hmm. I think he even has a book called Themed Worlds. So I recommend that. 
Hmm. Let's see what oh, let's see what we got here. Honestly, uh, I'm not really screening these comments yet until I read them. Honestly, feeling that the on uh, that on the collaboration front, I'm super demotivated trying to chip away at projects alone and to get to in my own head when I work solo. Yeah, I, I don't like working solo at all. I I well, it's like I kind of like have to get some input and then I like to collaborate and, and make an idea better. Um and then if I'm getting paid to do it, I kind of just have to do it. But that's like, that's a little bit different. Like we were talking about earlier um, with deadlines and things like that. Um, cool. I think, I think one, of the, one of the most important distinctions between a professional creative and a non-professional creative is the ability to compartmentalize uh, mm. in your life to be able to focus your energy on not being worried or angry about everything that's happening around you that you know you may or may not have any control over uh, to be able to focus all of your energy on the task at hand. Uh, I, you know, like I literally have to like, you know, close my eyes and take a deep breath and just, you know, sort of like push everything away to, you know, put my hands on the keyboard and, and make the music, you know, for my clients <laughs> and, you know, who are depending on me, you know, and all the, uh, all the guests who are going to enjoy the music in the future uh hopefully you know and you know you talk about collaboration it's like you know use like 99 percent of my work is done by myself here in the studio and has been for a very long time but for the last uh couple of months uh i've been collaborating with uh with a friend we all know and if i say his name it'll give it too much away uh we've been working together on a show and literally it's been like every day sitting together in the studio co-writing stuff and co-arranging stuff and co-performing stuff. And mm -hmm. that's really the first time in almost 30 years that I've done that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really rewarding and really, really fun. Uh, and I'm super control freaky when it comes to music production and the way things are arranged and things like that. But like, man, it was, uh, it was really a joy. And um, I hope people get to experience what we created. So I have a question for RJ and well, both of you guys really, because I, when it comes to like where, you know, RJ, you do like 50 different things. Andy, I'm sure you do 50, 49 things. Um, where do you guys like compose your music? Do you do it in your head ahead of time? Like, or do you, are you really just like on the keyboard or the piano doing it? Or, you know, I know RJ, you do writing. Like, where do you think you do your writing or your ideation for things like that? Um, I think a lot of it is, you know, just kind of going back to what I said about being being uh, inspired by everything. You know, music is is more than just instruments. It's nature. It's it's the door shutting. It's all these different things, you know. And so when you apply it to to just the the you just have an arsenal of inspiration, you know, um, you can kind of pick and choose. It depends on the story, too, that you want to tell. Um, and a lot of times, you know, when, when, especially when I'm, I'm composing something, I want to know everything about, you know, the song. And sometimes it's really about, especially when you're working with an artist, you know, it's almost like, I want to know about, you know, what makes you happy, what makes you sad. And, mm -hmm. and then being able to maneuver those feelings into song, into, into chord structures. And, and, and when you are able to approach it that way, you actually get something unique and not necessarily you know, of course you want commercial, but then you want commercial and organic a little bit too. You know, something that actually brings out the personality um, of, of whatever that experience is or who that person is that's singing the song. And so I really I really start, you know, from scratch, just like everybody else, you know, you pull out a piano, get, get a music software, you know, um, and, and kind of start there, but but then being being like intoxicated with that story and allowing that to maneuver into your core choices is, is my way. I just yeah. had that, a similar conversation with one of my other clients uh, this weekend um, in which uh, he was very nervous about trying to speak the language of music and try to, you know, have a conversation about music mm -hmm. and to express like what he wanted from the music. And I'm like, no, 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 don't worry about that. You know, you didn't go to school for music. I don't expect you to be able to like talk about, you know, uh, what's a, what are they, you know, you know, uh, suspended chord is or anything like that. It's just like, uh, you know, I, I asked my collaborators, my creative directors and people to, to, to speak about emotion and feelings. What are the, what are the, how do you want to feel when you're, you know, 
in this scene or that scene or or see when you see this character how how are you supposed to feel what are the emotions mm. and and then you hire me to translate that into music like that's my thing that's my problem you know don't you worry about like technical stuff or anything you know using the correct terminology like what's the difference between a viola and a viola and a cello don't worry we got you that's right well i and i so i you know my prairie mary way of conveying my creativity is creative writing um and i do a lot of story development ideation and all that kind of great stuff and uh, I don't want to paint a vivid picture for you guys, but like most of my ideation and, and story writing happens in the shower in the morning. And I just, I'm in there for an hour or 30 minutes just sitting in the shower. I, know it's, I don't want to paint a big picture, but a little bit of, uh, thinking about, um, okay, we have this attraction, this IP or this, whatever, how's that going to work? And I take the things that I had from my meetings in the previous day and really just hash it out. And I talk it through in myself, like, acting and I almost I, I also like act things out too um in my head um and then then I go and as soon as I have like 30 minutes to or an hour to start putting all the pieces together and I then I actually start writing because I I had and then you start connecting all the dots you know it's like the outline and the main flows in my head and then I can I can weave the fabric in um which is really cool and I'm always interested to talk to the creatives to see how they work you know are they in their head playing the music ahead of time or, or, and, you know, and I have to be, my brain is kind of crazy. So I have to be like so isolated to dis disconnect from the world. No, no technology, just like here, my brain's racing and all that. So um, no, that was, that was, no, it's great to hear that conversation. Patrick, um, you want to pull up that comment from Zeus Stoves? Let's see. Uh, the uh, author you mentioned, Scott Lucas with a K. Yes, that is correct. Scott Lucas with a K. I should have said that. I almost said Scott Lucas with a K, but yeah, that's correct. And then he, he, he replied to our question earlier, so I'd love to respond to this. Uh, Twitter and Instagram are very low. LinkedIn has been moderately affected for me. Effective. Uh, I've been given up on the most other art sites like DA and ArtStation. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what. I don't really know what those other stations. I don't know what art station is or DA is. I, I, but he's talking about Demon Art. Demon Art. Okay, so that's like being Deviant Art. Deviant Art. Deviant art. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah, I definitely don't know. Um, I don't. I, I. I can't comment on those, but I can tell you that LinkedIn, I, I think, is a is a gold mine of opportunity uh, for people. I, I. I had a personal Instagram, and I kind of stopped using it a few months ago, um, and I, I don't really use it really that much at all anymore. Um, I never used it for professional reasons. It was more for connecting with friends. Uh, Twitter, I, in January, I made a, a deliberate maneuver where I wanted to be more uh, active on Twitter, which has paid off for outreach, um, which has been fantastic. I've met all sorts of new people outside of the industry, um, which is huge um, um, for, with with Twitter. So uh, Twitter's all about how you want to use it and what you're sharing. Most of the time, it's just people want to hear stupid little comments. And so I give it to them. And then a little bit of insightful uh, stuff about changing the industry and then I go back to the stupid stuff and then uh, <laughs> so we're gonna change the world and then you know back to the little the humor and the commentary which is is, is always fun um, what do you guys think about Twitter uh, you know you guys are both on it but I don't know if you guys are really engaged and use it very often yeah I, I think I think for social media I kind of approach it almost like seasoning in a cabinet you know you kind of choose like what's going to work for the situation you're trying to you're trying to <laughs> trying to make better. Um, so, I mean, I've always have used, you know, all of those platforms, but it depends on what you want to achieve. I mean, if you just want to, you know, have a, you know, show a picture of your dog, you know, just go on Facebook, you know, yeah. but if you get a job, you know, go to LinkedIn, <laughs> you know, and so and I mean, and, and it doesn't narrow out. I mean, there, there are avenues where Facebook does open up doors. Twitter mm -hmm. does up doors you know i've seen plenty of job offers that are on twitter but as far as it being what it's created for you know just kind of staying knit to staying close to what the what it is and and what it's what it's built for and and utilizing tools i mean i've i've used linkedin for years like even before i got the jobs that i got now i've been you know getting to know all types of people because i always believe you know um especially with linkedin if it's something that you want to achieve like a creative director or or a writer or something like that. that's the perfect place to type in, you know, the name of the company and then the name of the title. And mm -hmm. then all these people just come up and you can just hit connect, 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 connect. And, and I mean, maybe out of your 100, like two people will say yes. And then you start talking and you never know that could open the job. That's that I've done that plenty of times. And it's always opened up a door somehow. Yeah. LinkedIn is like, it's like a IAPA mixer 
in real life. Like, you know, exactly. LinkedIn is, is like, you know, it's it's literally a virtual mixer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I it's I've I've I, I totally agree with you. Like the access to information that people have right now is unreal. When I was trying to get a job in 2008, 2009, I didn't I mean it was you. It was hard to even know what, how the hell they even get in this industry. Now there's so many resources. Um, about four years ago, four or five years ago, I messaged a creative executive at a company, and um, I, after talking a little bit of follow up, you know, he took me out to lunch. Like that's a creative executive at a company. Like people are willing to meet you. Um, and if we were right now, I've been doing a lot of virtual chats with people, and I'm sure there's people watching who know who done exactly what I'm talking about. Connect with me, and I've talked to them. I will talk to anybody. I will not. There's nobody. I'm never going to refuse um, to meet virtually with somebody, give them career advice and tell them my story and try to help them out. So uh, I think LinkedIn is an amazing tool. Twitter is an interesting thing. I, I actually had a, a Instagram live story the other day talking about Twitter, which is like I kind of I find Twitter to be a little more um, very interesting because you can really easily control um, your the, the things that you're seeing. So Facebook is like a war zone or you're in an echo chamber. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I, I like Facebook. It sometimes gets a little much and it's a little depressing and a little hostile and a little, Oh, uh, okay. Like, you know, but then there's a little bit of goodness in there too. Um, like, you know, when RJ ever posts anything, I'm like, like share, uh, subscribe. Um, <laughs> and then when you get to, um, and I always thought Twitter was like a war zone too. So, but then a friend of mine, um, a, a, a couple years ago said, you know, Twitter is a tool. It's not good. It's not bad. It's how you use it. And so if you go on Twitter and you follow a specific assortment of people and they spread negativity, you're going to have negativity. But if you go on Twitter and specifically follow the things that you want to follow and you have the, the right curation, it's going to be a fun tool to, to share and connect with other people. And, and I've definitely done the latter and I, I find it to be, you know, very interesting and, and seeing different perspectives. And, you know, my wife's always like, are you on Twitter over there? And I'm like, no, no. Yeah, I'm on Twitter. Sorry. Uh, she doesn't find the value as much as I do. Um, yeah. My Twitter is funny. Uh, you know, I follow a lot of the, you know, theme park Twitter, Diz Twitter and uni, uni Twitter, mostly I, as a spectator, yeah. you know, and uh, what's funny is that occasionally I'll comment or whatever. And it's just like, you know, most people don't know that like, you know, I, you know, know a lot more than them. But, um, and then like my other Twitter, you know, I have like four different Twitters. It's like, you know, it's the theme park Twitter. And then I have, I will have my, I follow my Vegas Twitters and my architecture Twitters and then the city skylines Twitters. And yeah. so like, that's my feed. It's just like, it's theme parks, Vegas architecture and city skylines. And like, that's all I see. And it's great. It's great to wake up in the morning and be like, what's new in these stupid worlds. <laughs> Well, it, and, and there's so much expertise. Like, I'll just like post a question. Hey, who's the ride manufacturer for this? And then, like, within 30 seconds, somebody answers you. And I'm like, oh, wow, people are really looking at this. That's cool. So no, no one looks at my Twitter. I have like 300, <laughs> less than 300 followers. I post anything and I'll get one like from the UK. It's like, okay. Yeah. Why do I bother? <laughs> Follow me on Twitter, folks. Patrick S. Kling. Got to get that plug in. <laughs> I'm, Follow I'm, me or don't. Like, whatever. Make it cool. Mm. It was funny. Um, I can't even remember my Twitter, and somebody just sent me a a, a, a follow. I don't even. <laughs> I don't know if I remember. Well, you actually have like RJ Temple is your handle, which is actually really awesome. That that's that's what that is. That's that's really great. Yeah, yeah. I caught Twitter like in the early stages when it was like you could do anything, you could have any kind of a uh, title. What you want. I joined oh. in 2010, and I have less than 300 followers. <laughs> I think you have a great content. Um, it's it's work. You have to work at it. You really do. You have to really be, you have to have content. Um, I did have a treat that went viral, of like eighteen million people. But um, yeah, that was great. That was just so stupid. <laughs> for all the things that go viral, that's not the one. It's all, it's all downhill from there for you. I know. I, I peaked too early. Um, no, that's great. So let's go back to the comments. Now that we went on a Twitter rant, which is great. Um, some things we have. Oh, we have a lot of things. Okay. Oops. Did we already say, okay. So, uh, LinkedIn has been phenomenal. It's been incredibly inspirational. It allowed me to see into the minds of our amazing professionals as well as up and coming new minds. Absolutely agree. I love it. Um, I, lo I love LinkedIn. I mean, love's a strong word. I, I, I think it's a great tool, I guess. And it's interesting and I love supporting people on it. Um, 
let's see. It's a great way to feed the mind and motivation when low and keep learning. Yeah. Um, I have a fun story. Um, yeah. Uh, with, uh, our, cause I'm, I'm a puppeteer, work with puppets for all my life. Been a, been a fan of the Muppets, been a fan of, of, uh, of Disney and how they do things as well. Um, but one thing I've always, I, I've used LinkedIn like for, for so long, I used to always look up, you know, people from Sesame Street or anything like that. And I, it, one of my good friends is that John Kennedy, a um, really great guy, um, worked on a lot of different projects um, with Henson. Um, and I found him on, on LinkedIn and it ended up to where it opened up a door for me to go to California to do a workshop at Jim Henson. Cool. Um, because I found I found him on LinkedIn and he helped me put together my portfolio. He helped me, you know, do all these different things. And come to find out he lives he lived here in Winter Park. Oh. You know? <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, so so that's 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 one of my favorite stories, you know, about LinkedIn. You just never know. And I mean, just his influence, you know, has inspired me to to do what I'm doing today, you know, and a lot of the projects that I've done like um has been from his influence. Just from that one, that one connect on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, you, you've both inspired me to, to participate more in LinkedIn. I'm going to, I'm going to include it more in my daily routine. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. It's great. Good. I know you're <laughs> Patrick and a troll your mustache. <laughs> well, <laughs> to our web. But it's, and, and, and also, I'm, I'm sure there's a what would be fantastic is, you know, to start doing outreach. There's especially on Twitter. There's so many people that don't even think that you can get a job in being a musician or a composer in the industry. And so it's like, OK, there's a lot of outreach you can do to help the next generation. You know, they're not a, the next. They're not a threat to you yet. Um, so why not help out and, and spread the word around? You know, I think there's so many people that can. Um, the thing the thing I tell most composers that want to get into theme parks is uh you really? <laughs> I'm sorry. If people want to hear Steve Lowe coming, so I give them to <laughs> Good. Accurate. Well said. <laughs> um, sorry, Andy, go ahead. Uh, no, it's okay. Occasionally, I have uh, 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 composers and music type people uh, ask me, you know, like, how do I get in the industry? Like, what do I do? Blah blah blah. You know, and I listen to their music, and like one of the one of the things that I invariably have to tell them is like you really need to broaden your styles mm, because yeah. you know one day you yeah. can be doing you know symphonic metal and the other day you're doing you know folksy bluegrass and you've got to be able to be versatile in your uh, style and and listen to every kind of any kind of and every kind of music out there and be comfortable there and uh, be able to move you know, in between the raindrops, kind of, you know, and and to be as versatile as you possibly can be, because you know, to just be like, oh, I do like, you know, Alan Silvestri action music, and like that's my mm -hmm. thing. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. great. So I'm only going to call you for those gigs, but mm -hmm. you're not going to make a living off of that. Yeah. You're going to make a living off of doing, you know, music for Nickelodeon properties and universal, you know, action properties or horror properties or things like that. You know, you have to be ready to accept any challenge and, and able to, you know, step up and, and to move into those different worlds. So, with content, I, with so if I was, a, I'm, OK, I'm going to tell you what my plan would be. I never thought of this. I'm going to do it real time for both your feedback. So if I was a musician and I wanted to get in the industry. I would take online videos of existing attractions and overlay my own score to them and have that be my portfolio. What do you think about that idea? Would that be a good idea or, or what do you think? I see that all the time with film composers. Film, that there, mm -hmm. In fact, there was even a, a, a HBO sponsored contest where they uh, posted a scene from uh, the recent season of Westworld and uh, they invited composers to score the scene. And they gave you the dm and E's, and you, you had all the dialogue and effects and you scored this scene. And they had a whole contest, and you know, you won. I think it was with the, uh, might have been with Cine Samples or some one of those sample libraries where, like, if you won, you won the whole library, and um, or you won like five thousand dollars. I remember I didn't, I didn't have time to enter because I was working. Uh, but like, I know uh, Carl Johnson, who is a really famous uh, theme park composer, and he did the recent Warner Brothers cartoons, the new Looney Tunes. He did half of those. 
Uh, he worked uh, with me on Warner Brothers. I worked with him, and um, he did it. And like like thousands and thousands of other composers were doing it. And it's a common thing you'll see on YouTube on composers' pages. They'll rescore entire scenes in their own style. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I would love to see that. I'd love to see somebody like take one of the rides that I work on, like Men in Black or something like that. And like you know, yeah, score it. Like yeah, show me your show me your take. Like why not? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, showing your versatility, you know, showing that you're multifarious as a as a musician, um, knowing the instruments, knowing the, the 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 meter and the time signature, you know, the choices. Because there's a lot of different, you know, things as, as far as music theory wise um, to accomplish certain styles of music. And so, for you to be a student of the game and really knowing what it takes to create, you know, a Celtic kind of song or a polka, you know, theme song or playing jazz or playing hip hop or playing a, a cinematic experience, you know, doing something for an attraction is different from doing something for a game. You know, there's there's always like this thing that you have to keep in mind and, and, and just be just just really just challenge yourself, you know, and then on top of that, you know, showing that you're up for the challenge. You know, there's been so many so many times where I mean, I've, I've, I've played in churches. And mm -hmm. I play for 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 gigs downtown. Mm -hmm. I I made video games and I made music for film and I made music for a, a car salesman. It's all done, you yeah. know. Yeah, you've got to be able to like you've got to be able to like listen to a temp track and dissect it and recreate it accurately. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And to be able to have those tools, you need to practice, practice, practice. You need to like be constantly listening and and dissecting and and you know, mimicking, you know, almost, you know, because like a lot of what we do, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not ashamed to say is like, you know, uh, copying temp tracks because like producers and directors and creative directors and, and, and uh, executives get really, really married to their temp tracks and their scratch tracks. Yeah. And like, you've got to be able to just give them what they want. And if what they want is the temp track and you've got to do something, you know, as close to that as possible without getting in, various kinds of trouble then that's the gig yeah yeah i agree i mean it was like i was a professor at la film school for a while and we had a whole class about sequencing technologies and sound alikes and sound -alikes. you can't say sound alikes we can't say it anymore it's like <laughs> really prevented from saying it really <laughs> oh yeah it's a oh, big well, yeah yeah but those and i mean and, and the thing is is like you know understand i think the, the whole concept of all that is to understand the wheelhouse of what it takes to create a different style of music. And so for you to be able to connect with those with those soft instruments and then really be able to articulate that. Um, and then on top of that, in time, you know, like, you know, that's the thing. Yeah. You know, being able to know how to articulate that style in 30 seconds, 60 seconds, you know. Yeah. Or less, 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Like, yeah. uh, Prudence, yes, absolutely. And uh, Corey Jackson's comment, uh, yeah versatility in music style means versatile so you don't have to know how to play the celtic flute but you have to know at least the 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 capabilities and what we'd call the uh the you know, idiomatic kinds of lines and performances that that are typical of that instrument and if you have like the sample library to know you know the parameters you know the, the ranges you know you don't have to like know how to play every instrument i mean i mean i you know arranging and performing for you know 120 piece orchestras and choir like every day. And I don't know how to play the oboe or the bassoon or the French horn or double bass or anything but trombone. Uh, but like, I understand their range and their uses and their their place in the in the, in the the different various choirs of the orchestra and, and music theory and counterpoint and all that. But like, no, you don't have to know how to play every instrument, but you have to know what each instrument wants to play. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and shout out too, cause Corey Jackson is one of the original upbeat puppeteers. Oh, cool. uh, from Savannah. So he he, st he he was with me when I first got started. So shout out to the Corey. What's up, man? Hey, Corey, uh, thanks for your question. Hey, man. Yeah, yeah, great question. Yeah, and I mean, just like we said, you know, if you don't know how to play a certain instrument, you know, this is the importance of collaboration. You know what I'm saying? At least you can articulate the idea and then have somebody help you, you know, be able to do that. And also you got music samples. You got all these different tools and things. So if you don't know how to play a certain instrument, I mean, you can, you can, Go through these softwares and, and get anything you wish, you know, to, to sound like you you've done it yourself. So it's, it's a lot of options out there. Yeah, the never, there's never it's never been easier to be a music producer. Hmm. So we have a, a little uh, it's a completely different question. 
Um, I know this may sound like an odd question. Well, they, there it goes. Do you think Sally Corp would make a good five nights at Freddy's dark ride attraction in, in working with Bloomhouse, or would you go with Garner Holt? Hey, um, let me get, let me get rich on the phone. Yeah, I was gonna, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure either. I mean, I don't know that Garner Holt does dark rides. They do animatronics, unless yeah. something changed. Um, so I definitely would go with um, uh, with. Uh, Rich at uh, our good old friend Rich at uh, Sally, and maybe they'll they'll contract Garner Holt anyway. So you never know how that that will work. I don't think so. <laughs> no, they won't. No, okay, maybe they won't. <laughs> uh, Rich, 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 uh, Sally working with Garner Holt on a project would be like Disney working with Universal on a project. Ah, uh, okay. I didn't know that they were that they were that separate. At least that's what you know. Got um, cool. We have another actual question that's uh, from about music. Not that that was not an actual question, but an actual question about music. So I'd love to hear. Another one from Corey. Do you let your primary instrument drive your style, or do you adjust to the need? RJ? Adjust to the need, you know, because mm -hmm. that's what's going to make the, the client happy. <laughs> <laughs> because it, that's, that's really what it boils down to. I think sometimes our ideas get in the way of what the real need is. And so if you really can just stick to that, you know, and then try to maneuver your musical choices around that, then you'll you'll get through the project faster. I think sometimes people say, well, I, I come up with the coolest ideas. You need this. And it's like, no, I, I need you to take your knowledge and apply, you know, whatever weird, vague way I said to, to come up with this music, you know, make up some sense around it so I can open this show that's next week. And so, <laughs> and so I just think it's really about having some discipline and, and, and make sure you focus on the need than anything else because that's what pays you and not only pays you pays you quickly yeah i totally agree with all that where did yeah. patrick go patrick sorry yeah. i was saving my twitter profile to have it be people want to get a little dialogue <laughs> uh so i guess you know we're kind of getting to the end of our hour here in about five minutes um would love to just kind of do a round table with some final thoughts about uh, the original topic, which was staying creative um, during these uh, this pandemic. So maybe just like a primary word of advice that you'd give um, about that. Uh, Andy, I'll throw it to you just because you're sitting here in the center of the screen. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, man, I mean, I don't I never think of myself as one of those effusively creative people. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of like creative on demand. Um, hmm. But um, you know, uh, but when I do work, I, I do think of it as creative work, and I always I'm always thinking of the story that I'm supporting. Uh, I I want to help 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 my clients uh, tell their story through music, and like that is my primary creative motivation is to help tell a story and make you feel things about the characters and the situations through music. And like to me, it's like problem solving. You know, I'm kind of a robot like that, where like you know, I think of creativity as problem solving. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I just, like I said before, I just I have to like, just take it, you know, take a deep breath and push everything else away. And I'm, I'm, as you can see, I'm here in my windowless room. All I have to do is, is close the door and everything goes away. You know, I close my internet browser most of the time, put my phone on silent and just like get to it. Yeah. RJ. Yeah. Um, um, Oh, you're in a black void. Uh, you have nothing. <laughs> I love that. I love that background. I got to get one of those. Yeah. yeah, man. Yeah, fabric. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> one thing about this is that, uh, of course, in, being in the middle of a pandemic um, and and trying to you know stay motivated with this. I mean, there are for, for for me. I just I just grew. You know, what I'm saying I was able to you know really focus on myself and find out where my strengths and weaknesses are. And then it turned into something that was positive and actually um, was able to, you know, fix, you know, my financial situation in the meantime, while other things are being sorted out. Um, so so I think in this particular thing, this is this is like, you know, creativity, just 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 recalibrating, you know, think of this situation in, pan, as in the pandemic as a way for you to look back at what you do, look at all your skill sets, look at everything that you can accomplish. I mean, there's nothing. That, that's too small, you know, look at everything that you can do and see how you could change the world with your gifts and talents, you know, um, from administration all the way up until, you know, building, you know, amazing things for people to experience. Everything is, is important. And you have to look at and, and see how how it could how you can change. Because here's the thing he was uh, um, Andy was talking about something about problem solving, you know, 
pandemic, this has changed everything. Mm -hmm. Like people are looking for solutions. So, so having this time to yourself, you can really look back and be like, you know, hey, I, I want to I want to be able to, you know, do something that's going to give people more flexibility, you know, during a situation where they can't be around a lot of people. They looking for answers of how can we do that? And so utilizing this time is, is so important and we need creativity like never before. So I totally encourage you guys, you know, don't get discouraged about, you know, even if you feel like you've never been a leader, maybe this is the time for you to really think about being a leader now. You know, maybe this is the time for you to really start thinking about, you know, hey, I don't need to be, you know, um, that person that's always waiting for somebody to tell me to do something. Let me let me just jump out there and just watch, you know, because I mean, I was always afraid to be on camera and doing all these different things. And now it's like, well, this is the only way to talk to people. I might as well get over this. You know, <laughs> you know this is the most radio shows and podcasts I've been on in my entire life. <laughs> And, and I got over it and I realized that, man, I actually tapped into something that I was always afraid of. Mm. And, and it changed everything about me. And it, it made me a better musician. It made me a better writer. It made me a better producer. It made me a better dad. It made me a better everything. And so um, knowing that you, you maintain that creativity, you know, during this time, don't let it discourage you. Let it encourage you. And then once you do that, it will encourage others to do the same thing. So don't give up, y'all. This is just the beginning. And we we can all do it together. Uh, Man, you said it better than any of anyone I, I ever thought could. Well, I'll add to that. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're not gonna we're not to we're not, we're not gonna top that. Come on, man. All right. So <laughs> what are you doing? Back? <laughs> <laughs> My backdrop for a brief moment. Is that a cushion? <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit of a cushion. It was actually one of those like, things you sit on. Um so <laughs> Yeah, my, uh, you know, piggyback, obviously, like, I, I, I think that I, I definitely can empathize with people that don't even know where to start, you know, so I think make it game, gamify it, you're a writer, or you're, you're an artist, you're whatever, take six different genres and six different, whether it's, a, you know, I work in the attractions world, so six different attraction hardwares, put them yeah. in a hat, take them out and, and say, okay, I got pirates and a, a seesaw or whatever the heck it is, doesn't really matter. And um, just they are using that to produce it. Um, there was a student, a uh, recent graduate who I met, who just who did a very similar thing, where she had a general theme of a park, and then she started doing attraction posters um, based on randomized words. So she took different, like a, a, an attraction name randomizer, and started just to create um, graphic, like portraits of it, like those um, right. uh, posters. And it was like the coolest thing in the world. And, and she was doing it every single day. She was doing one. And so these those types of things of where you kind of like to like hack into your own creativity to keep yourself doing it is what I recommend. Um, and you know it's it's going to be a long haul, um, but the more amount of work that you do right now, I think it's therapeutic. I think you're going to feel better, um, and you're gonna you can you have the opportunity to learn new software, build an amazing portfolio, um, yeah. and and I mean God, the world's your oyster um, if you have time, and there's so much content online like this show, so. If you like the show, make sure you follow us on Facebook. Subscribe on YouTube, folks. It's great to have you. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of people that have been taking this opportunity to put in a lot of time towards their 10,000 hours. You know, mm -hmm. we, you know there's, there's the common saying about, like, you know, you're, you're not an expert at something until you've done it for 10,000 hours. And that's about four years at 40 hours a week. And I think that there's a lot of people that have been doing a lot of learning and growing and listening and reading and practicing and creating and uh i think we're going to come out of this uh this whole thing uh, you know the pandemic and and uh, you know the the big social changes that absolutely need to happen uh you know which is you know you talk about creative solutions and then that whole like you know tearing everything down and building up something better is going to create is going to take a lot of creativity mm. yeah you're on the edge of the Jetsons era. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, RJ, please stay on the line. We're going to end the show, but uh, don't go anywhere because we like to get talk right after we go off. Uh, folks, thanks for joining us. We go live every Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. RJ, thank you so much for coming thank on. You. Thank you so much, man. It was awesome. Come on anytime. Talk about whatever you want. Um, we said we'd start the show when the lockdown happened, and we'd do it for a few weeks, but clearly we'll be doing this until – you know, who knows until they kick us off the <laughs> air or we're all creative executives and we can't, uh, we can't say anything any longer. 
Um, until right. that day happens, <laughs> we'll be doing this. So we, so we ascend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, thanks for joining the show, of course. RJ, again, great stuff. Um, and everybody, uh, thanks for showing. I know we got a lot of repeat visitors. Our, our actual our viewership is going up quite a lot, which is pretty cool. So we know where you guys are coming back. We, we appreciate that. It, it makes it a lot more worth our while when we know there's dozens of people watching as opposed to, you know, just my, my parents. Um, <laughs> uh, with that. I don't think my mom watches it. If, if she's watching high. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think my mom watches. She knows I do the show, but I don't think she watches. So she does say, you know, let me know you, you watch. <laughs> All right. Thank so, you, know, we'll see you later. Bye, guys. Thanks.